Melna congregation. It gives me a great pleasure to share my thoughts with you this evening. And of course, I'm humbled to be uh, um, in this very auspicious space in terms of the mosque. So allow me to, to share, I would probably be, hopefully, you can be inspired by it, and of course motivated, um, and of course kind of map it onto your own mind or your thinking. So my presentation tonight, I uh, do divide it into, into three. Um, the first one is of course my influences, which I call my influences. Secondly, my intellectual encounters. And thirdly, of course, educational activism in action and of course, um, the environment in which I teach. And of course, with any influence, it starts with the home. So my parents was the first influence. And of course, related to parents um, is, is our engagement with the others and in terms of family and friends who frequent the house. And of course, not anyone, um, those who can contribute um, in terms of our growth, in terms of siblings. So yes, my parents were my first influences. And then of course, um, very early age in terms of madrasa, um, your influences, probably your teachers that engage with you at a very young age. Um, and of course, they still do make an impact on, on, on my life. And I'll kind of explain to you in terms of my, my stay at a particular madrasa. Then of course, uh, once you engage tertiary education, uh, you engage many people there, many lecturers, many professors, and of course they become your influences, and of course you select who you want to be influenced by. Um, you read many books and you can be influenced by that too, many Islamic authors. So yes, um, I was influenced by many. So uh, allow me just to share some encounters with them and of course how they impacted uh, my life. So the intellectual journey started uh, way back in Madrasa. Um, in fact, it was a, not far from here, I would say probably two, three kilometers from here. Um, I'm not sure of the, the name of the madrasa, but um, locally it would be called the bungalow. It was a wooden cabin that the madrasa was held in. And for, I would say probably nine or 10, or even 12 years, for that period, I would frequent the madrasa, me and my siblings, of course, whether it's after school, every religiously after school, Monday to Thursday. And of course, my influence there uh, was educator, or, or rather the, the, the mu'alim there, as uh, Yusuf Wahid. And of course, he was very influential in terms of uh, me engaging, or rather taking the journey in terms of education. And then later, of course, um, in terms of schooling, his primary school was Mahmoudia Primary School, um, quite a big a community school in terms of our Muslim community. High school, not too far from um, Mahmoudia, was Vitabu Mahai. So I spent my um, high school days at Vitabu Mahai. And um, thereafter, after matriculated in um, 1990, I spent some time at um, Icosa. Um, it was at Islamic College of Southern Africa. And I can still clearly remember, you probably know some of them, the personalities there, um, Sheikh Saudul Khan and many others around him. Um, and of course, they became some influence in, in, in my life in terms of, of, of deen, of a particular way of thought or, or rather way of thinking. Um, I, of course, did the Gifts program there. And then from there, um, I, I kind of browse very scantily and, and, and quick through it because I do have a lot to share. And then of course I uh, spend some time with Sheikh Bully, um, the popular Hafid. I spend some time with him. And then um, thereafter I proceeded to uh, Azadville in Johannesburg, uh, Ruhrdepoort. So I spend some time there. 
And then um, after that, I came back to Cape Town. Um, then I met Yusuf Wahid again. Uh, Yusuf Wahid was then a PhD candidate, and he was busy with his uh, PhD at UWC. And of course, we met up again, and uh, we started a madrasa. Madrasa we started at Al Najai Mosque, um, Bakrat Mosque, also not too far from here. So um, I was kind of the the educator at the mosque. Um, I would have two classes, Mondays to Thursdays, and um, Yusuf Wahid would be the officiating imam in terms of Al Najai Mosque for a good couple of years. And of course, um, when the uh, madrasa became very structured, then of course I became the administrator of the madrasa. And of course, we employed a few teachers, and of course, the community grew. Uh, from there, and I was kind of influential in, in, in that space. And then, um, th this was all prior to my tertiary education going to UWC. Then from there, I proceeded to UWC. Um, the program uh, was a BA program uh, with majors, in fact, uh, uh, philosophy. Um, that was one of my majors, and of course, um, coupled with that, was Al-Ukhat Al-Arabiya and Adrus Al-Ukhat Al-Arabiya. So my second or major was in fact Arabic. Um, and then of course I linked that to uh, stats. I did um, statistics. And of course my mathematics which allowed me to teach in terms of, of, of high school FET uh, mathematics. So um, I graduated there at, at um, UWC. Um, still very influential in terms of playing a role at a, at a local mosque. Um, and of course, um, became a educator at um, Modedamai. And then from there, uh, we kind of uh, had a good relationship still with Professor Wahid. And then, of course, um, he was taken up by um, the University of Stellenbosch University at the time. And then, of course, I, um, with his influence, of course, I enrolled in the, um, the honors program in educational policy studies with Professor Wahid. And um, that, that was a definite eye opener in terms of my intellectual journey at the Institute of Stellenbosch. Uh, from there, I was privileged um, to be sent to Malaysia um, to do some research. Um, in, in Islamic education coupled with democracy. In fact, that was my uh, uh, MIT program, the master's program. So I would do some research in, in, in Malaysia, um, an institute called ISTAC, Islamic, um, Islamic Thought, Islamic Thought yeah, and Civilization. Um, and of course, it was run by the, 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 the founder of the university or the institute, um, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Nagibul Atas. Um, I think he's probably, well, probably over 90 years old now, but he's, 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 he's still around. A uh, prolific scholar in terms of Islam, when it comes to Islamic thought as well as uh, Western thought. So I was greatly influenced by him, and of course, his philosophy of education. I can clearly remember while engaging with him, um, and, and, and one of the hadiths, which he um, centralizes in terms of Islamic education is Adabni Rabbi Fa Ahsana Ta'adibi. My Lord educated me and made, and made my education most excellent. So um, he kind of builds his notion of education, specifically Islamic education of philosophy, on that particular hadith. Um, and of course, derivatives of, of, that, had, um, of, of that notion of, of, of Adab, um, it's kind of Ta'adib, ta Ta'alim. Um, tarbiya, these kind of concepts he would kind of uh, use um, in instilling education with, 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 within us, which was um, very uh, um, kind of an eye-opener for me in terms of uh, my intellectual journey. Um, and then, of course, um, yes, I was very, very privileged in, in, in being at that institute. Um, that was in 2004 years. And then, of course, I came back, and in 2008, I was granted another opportunity to go to Roehampton University and spend some time at a, um, in fact, it was a workshop. Uh, I think it's probably two or three-week workshop 
based on social justice within education. In fact, that was the theme. Um, we were about 20 international students. I was the only one of South Africa. So it was kind of even very privileged in terms of being in that setting. It was only master's students with PhD candidates. So even that engagement kind of enriched me in terms of the uh, mindfulness um, of the, 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 the power of education, uh, the, transformer, the transformative possibilities within education and what it can do uh, given our situational context in which we come from in terms of South Africa. So that really helped me in, in, in shaping my thinking and of course being mindful um, when, when it gets to the space that we, where, where I occupy my educational environment in terms of Bonteville, uh, Moderdam High. So yes, um, throughout my journey, um, it is one of learning and one of teaching. And um, next slide. Um, so yes, educational activism. That's your, your of course, your. What what I find myself in is um, educational activism in action at a particular school, particular environment, a uh, particular social setting. Of course, if you know the environment in terms of bond table, um, it's definitely a challenging environment. Um, so yes, I spent uh, more than 20 years within uh, that setting. And of course, engaging um, the community, engaging the learners when it uh, comes to maths and science. Yes, I'm the HOD of maths and science, so with that comes a huge responsibility in terms of curriculum del delivery, um, you engage the stakeholders in terms of parents, um, and of course, um, of course you have a group of teachers around you, and of course that you need to kind of um, a mentor sometimes even if you have a novice teacher. So yes, I serve on the SMT, the um, senior management team as well, um, particularly uh, where I find myself in, I do organize programs, excursion, workshops for teachers, etc when it gets to the STEM agenda. And of course, we know STEM is about science, technology, engineering, and maths. Quite a big thing these days, uh, coupled with um, your, four, your four IR, fourth industrial revolution. And of course, the, um, more recently, the 17 um, sustainable development goals of the UN. Those kind of things um, are uppermost in educators' mind, especially when it gets to, to, to maths and science and the delivery thereof. Um, of course, you can see the slides. Um, some of them um, kind of explains the role that I play. Um, that one on top there, um, that's a famous SALT um, observatory in, in Sutherland. I took a group of students there in 2016. We were about 45. So I made that possible in terms of kind of exposing learners to a different type of setting. So that was quite a, a first for, for, for our kind of school, Moderdam. Uh, in terms of maths and science, we try to get any opportunity to get others involved within your maths and science setting, to expose learners to a different type of educator, of a different type of, of way of doing. And of course, in most cases, we would get in the, the um, MT and Science Center. So experiments and, and practicals would be done by them. Um, it's quite a novel thing in terms of students. Um, this one over here, uh, the picture there with a few learners. Um, that's also another, um, uh, they call it the IT challenge. It's kind of app development, quite interesting how it works. Uh, we were in a competition, in fact it's, a, it's a run through, it's quite a, in fact it's an international competition and we took part in it with the organization, uh, organization called Saki Kamal Foundation run by Fatima Jakut. Um, if you know her, she's the first pilot of uh, colored pilot or black pilot if you want to call it. And of course, um, she runs an organization called Saki Kama Foundation. And of course, we joined her in this program, ITGO Challenge. And of course, uh, we came 60. Quite a, a exciting in terms of exposing learners um, to the STEM agenda and of course, app development. And of course, I belong to a MESA Association of Maths and uh, Maths um, Education in South Africa. Um, of course, if you want to be a fay of the trends uh, within mathematics and science, and of course you need to belong to these organizations. Um, yes, um, some of my students, I uh, they belong also to um, this uh, organization called, or rather NGO called, uh, called Go for Gold. 
Um, it also has to do only with math and science. They identify math and science students, um, especially grade 10, 11, and 12. And of course, they go through a program, and after that, um, they can even subsidize you when you want to go to, um, into an educational or rather a tertiary institute. And of course, it needs to be within the sciences or engineering, and they kind of subsidize your 100% subsidy. So our program with them um, is probably for the last 10, 15 years. Um, so through that program, we, have the, we currently have about 10 to 15 um, engineers coming through that program. Um, then, of course, we coupled with these are all programs uh, that the department in terms of math and science department engage with on a daily basis or annually in terms of enrolling students. So last year we had a group of students at the Shine Academia. Um, I think it was first called Choco at U UCT. Um, now they're based at um, Grotesque um, School. Also a group of students. Uh, mostly of math and science students kind of have access to, to, to these kind of programs. And of course, when it gets to um, giving females or rather girl child opportunity, then of course we try to do that. Um, next slide. Um, other activities which I'm in, in, in involved in, um, of course, um, I'm the coordinator of the feeding scheme as well. We serve around about 80 kids on a daily basis. So the morning we uh, serve them with breakfast. And of course, first break, um, uh, we served them with some hot meal. Uh, we formed a partnership with um, Peninsula Schools Feeding Scheme. So they kind of, in a way, subsidize us with, with some greenery, some groceries, some, some vegetables. And of course, we need to do our own in terms of uh, finding donations or creating some way in terms of funding, funding that. So yes, um, I'm quite involved in, in, in terms of that program. And of course, we have a uh, supposed to be a memorial garden tour as well. We do have a garden, also I'm influential in terms of the garden, also coupled with an organization, NGO, NGO called um, Violent Prevention Urban Renewal. Um, and they also subsidize us with some seeds. Um, they also fitted a borehole not too long ago. So in that way, we're kind of um, creating a sustainable kind of um, feeding scheme. So we eat from the feeding scheme as well as the community benefit from it. And you have kind of pictures that you can see our students are involved in, in, in the feeding scheme. Um, and that is kind of the produce that we produce. Um, then of course, um, I'm also the um, IIT coordinator. Um, that was a big thing. I'll, I'll share some thoughts with you in terms of um, IIT. And, and how we got to, 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 to IT in terms of the computer lab. Um, not too long ago, I think it's in 2018 years, organization, a rather company, quite a corporate, big corporate company. In fact, they're based in Texas, uh, DXE Technology, but they do have a base here in, in Canal Hawk. They popped around and said there's a little competition going with around about 20 schools. We need to submit a needs analysis proposal in terms of our state of maths and science uh, in the school. And then, of course, um, I had to do the proposal. Eventually, we were shortlisted. And of course, um, they made us the beneficiary um, of that project, which, what does it mean? They invested um, just less than a million rand within the school, which was definitely a, a first for the school in terms of drawing that kind of investment to a uh, to kind of our school in a difficult in, in uh, environmental setting. So yes, uh, what does it mean? Um, they revamped our um, physical science labs. Uh, they issued us with um, around about 30, 40 computers, uh, theses. Um, each educator within the department, math and science department, received their own laptop. Uh, we have interactive whiteboards for each educator in terms of in the sciences. So that was a big um, plus in terms of the um, investment within our school in, in, uh, in 2018. Um, these are kind of photos so that you can see what kind of kids or what kind of learners we get. 
Um, at least within a class, um, these days is very difficult in terms of 100% back. So average class would, would be around about 45 learners in the average class, uh, which is quite big. And then of course, um, our biggest um, is around about 57 in a class. Um, we regard COVID as a blessing, in fact, in terms of our situation with social distancing. So we had a kind of an average of 30. Now it's back to our norm. So we kind of up the uh, upper to 45 in a class. And our biggest, like I said, was 57. And this is the type of students that we get. Uh, among, amongst them, I would say, there are gems amongst them, but they need to be discovered. Um, conditions need to be created for them to grow. And then from there, um, hopefully they can plow back within their own community. Um, and of course, on, on a regular basis, we try to do um, parcels for them. We contact organizations as Sansa, for example. Those are one of the organizations uh, which definitely assists us in terms of our need. Um, not too long ago, with our Baraka Bank as well, we received about 65 pairs of, of school shoes for the needy kids of, of, of our school. So that was a big thing. Um, so yes, we try to, to do what we need to in terms of the need of the community, the need of the school. Um, um, then of course, in terms of the computer lab, that is kind of the computer lab. And of course, we try to keep it active in terms of inviting and, and, and liaising with other teachers in the area or schools in the area. So we kind of try to be a hub and a central, central space so that others can come to us and uh, kind of benefit from our space. Um, next one. Um, on an annual basis, yes, I'm also influential in the um, activities when it gets to uh, Mandela Day. Uh, we do have a regular feeding. Uh, we do have a prepare in terms of preparing food. So on a regular uh, um, 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 occasion, and then of course we do feed the community. Um, of course, in close to Ramadan, we do exactly the same. We do have a feeding uh, program also within Ramadan, which is quite exciting in terms of getting the kids excited. Uh, we take the food to the community in terms of, 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 of iftar. So uh, that is kind of an annual agenda within the feeding scheme. And then, of course, uh, what I'm also a big part of is revamping our library into a smart library. Um, during COVID, then, of course, you have kind of uh, a lot of playtime. Playtime means uh, um, a time to do something else instead of teaching or administrative time. And then, of course, I decided to revamp the library. The library was dormant for a good couple of years. Um, I wrote some letters to, to a few organizations and companies, and they would sponsor. Um, even one of the sponsors sponsored a, a smart TV, for example. So um, I think it's all to do how you ask. Um, so yes, this is the setting that was kind of the old library. Um, and then, of course, that's me kind of revamping the library. We also receive paint. Um, so I would kind of utilize my time, free time, in terms of painting even, um, in, in, in terms of um, our library project. Within our library project, too, uh, we connected with the NGO, the Bookery. I'm not sure whether you know the Bookery is also an NGO, um, which they supply our our cataloging system, it's a Libuan system. In fact, all universities and educational institutes use that system, it's a Libuan system. With the system, um, they granted us around about three to 4,000 books, um, updated books, um, in terms of shelving with, with, with our library. Um, yeah, so um, that was big in terms of um, our intellectual growth within giving the kids opportunity in terms of of, of their thinking and their uh, literacy. Um, then this one over here, what happens on the daily? I think this is the one. We can move forward to the next slide. Uh, you can probably go back, go back, as I see it's different to this. Yeah. Uh, what happens from time to time? We get um, people in, organizations in, for example, to engage. So uh, our teaching and learning is really is very uh, collaborative. Um, it's not one teacher in the class. Sometimes we get others in, others organizations in. Uh, maybe there's different methods, different ways in terms of teaching, especially when it gets, gets to maths and science. So we kind of on and off days 
or, or other occasions we try to do that. And then of course the other slide, um, some kids make use of the computer lab in terms of little groups. And of course we also afforded a STEM lounge which allowed, allowed learners to engage critically within that particular space. Um, and then of course, um, more recently, um, I was the um, uh, Kada Asmal Excellence Award um, candidate um, in terms of the, the province. Um, so this was conferred on me, which was definitely a, 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 um, a humble experience in terms of receiving that for my role that I play um, within maths and science, within the difficult situ uh, situational context, as well as the um, social justice agenda in terms of what needs to be done to a, a difficult community, in terms of changing a unsatisfactory situation in which they find themselves and hopefully um, uh, kind of contribute in a meaningful and a positive way. So um, that is my contribution in terms of uh, sharing with you. Um, lastly, in conclusion, I do have a, a, um, a thinking around education and how I think it needs to happen, and I can probably explain what I mean by it. Um, my, my understanding is that we need to develop a conception of mathematical education or education that can cultivate imaginative, deliberative, and responsible action. Um, and can only augment social justice within education and beyond. Um, of course, within the sciences, within the maths, uh, we need to be imaginative. Um, the setting that we find ourselves in, in terms of our setting, we need to think out of the box um, in terms of being imaginative. We need to cooperate and uh, deliberate with others. We need to form alliances. We need to network with others. And of course, our um, actions need to be responsible. So yes, um, all with the aim to kind of um, augment social justice within education and beyond. So shukran for allowing me to, to share my thoughts with you. Uh, shukran, brother uh, Adnan uh, Adams, for a most uh, inspirational uh, presentation. And shukran for, for your willingness to actually uh, open up. Um, You've been attending this mosque for so long, and we know your family very well. And um, what this, the envisaged um, intention of these Tuesday night programs has been exactly what I have experienced here tonight. And that is in building social cohesion, we're getting to understand each other on a much deeper level. There were a number of things that I knew about you and many things I did not know about you. Um, and um, we're inspired by that and uh, extremely proud to actually hear about it. And inshallah, hopefully we can have more conversations offline uh, in terms of how we can actually mutually benefit from each other. Um, in terms of uh, questions, there's about four, three questions that I've got. Uh, the first one is, how do you manage with extraordinary large numbers of like at occasion 57, 57 children in a class and still manage to actually effectively teach? How do you actually do that? Um, yeah, yeah. Is num numbers, the numbers game is a difficult game and a difficult um, engagement in terms of getting to everyone. Um, how do we try and, and, and kind of monitoring if teaching does take place within that type of setting? Um, we do have a, particular, particularly within our program, um, the, 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 the government, uh, you, you need to kind of submit a work plan um, and a monitoring plan. How are you going to do it in terms of teaching for the year? So we do it per term. Um, so how we do it in terms of uh, at our school, specifically in the math and science, my department, we would run regularly at least once a week a kind of a test, at least on, on a Friday. If it doesn't happen on a Friday, then it's kind of a Monday. So that is our way in terms of monitoring. Uh, I don't always need to mark the, the, uh, the, the informal test. 
uh, we can kind of shift it to them too, and they can be part of the process in terms of marking. So in that way, I think we try to get to everyone and try to see where everyone is at that particular uh, stage. So it's not an easy thing. Sometimes we do manage it and sometimes not. Uh, sometimes you do envisage you need to cover this for this particular period, but I wouldn't say in most cases, but sometimes you don't even get through half of the lesson. And then of course it becomes a, a difficult thing in terms of reteaching the, the next day. So it is a challenge in terms of the numbers, yes. Uh, but it does happen, it does happen, yeah. So um, that, that is something, uh, it's definitely a learning for us who um, basically try to run madrasas on a weekend, um, that very concept mm. of actually having um, regular tests and uh, assessments absolutely, uh, to absolutely. see exactly where learners are, to know what it is that you have to re reteach, re yes. um, and to actually know who's developing and who's falling yeah. behind, etc. Yeah. So I'm actually very glad to uh, hear just, that. Just to add on that, we even um, kind of give, gave them a kind of glossary if a certain topic comes up, there's a certain vocabulary that they need to know. So we kind of give it to them before the time. So and hopefully they can go through it once we get to that topic, okay, it's kind of familiar to them already. So that's, even that can assist in terms of getting the content and, and what we kind of need to teach. Great. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that for me is actually a learning that we actually need to also take to our madrasa and uh, we do do it, but not to that extent. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think madrasas across the country can actually learn from just that one little procedure. Second is something that intrigued me and that the newspapers when you got this award spoke about how you actually go about demystifying mathematics. Can you maybe just expand a little bit about that? Um, in terms of maths, um, yeah, kind of, it is a difficult, uh, it seems to be a difficult subject. Um, yes, we, we engage um, the subject at a different level. We get into it at a different level. Our foundation, where we come from in terms of maths, when it gets to, especially when it gets to the um, senior phase, kind of 9 and 10 and 11, then it becomes a different type of, of, of thinking. So for me, definitely, it's a language on its own. You need to learn the language as well. Uh, but so, the, like everything, confidence needs to be built. So again, the scaffolding needs to happen within the subject itself. Um, it's not the easy thing. Um, currently, um, just at our school, uh, we partnered with the company called Olico that takes out grades eight to grade nine and so on in terms of scaffolding. So what they do, um, they take out key concepts with, with, within mathematics and kind of consolidate that and hopefully those kind of concepts, they can build on and take it to grade nine and hopefully to grade 10. So it's not everything that they do cover, but key concepts which, which kind of assist the kid um, in terms of building confidence. Um, that's the one point. The second point, I think, in terms of demystifying, um, I, I think that it, it seems that we don't have the patience um, to learn a new thing or to learn a new topic with, with, within maths. Immediately when it gets to the more challenging, and then, of course, we, we tend to leave it and then we kind of blaming the subject, we blaming the maths in terms of it is too difficult. But I think we don't have the discipline um, in mastering certain concepts. So we can go to any other country, for example. Uh, we can go to Singapore and then of course the Far East and China, for example. They said hours in terms of struggling with certain topics. Um, so I think um, it's not, yeah, in terms of demystifying, I think we need to rethink and relook in terms of our level of discipline, our level of focus, and of course, um, engaging the difficult, the, uh, difficult concepts, I think we need to give ourselves more time in terms of mastering certain topics, especially the youngsters. Um, I do have a group of, of students, yes. Um, they start off good uh, in terms of maths, not within maths already, two, three, four weeks within maths, then they want to move to literacy, it's too difficult. So it becomes a problem in, in, in terms of that. So how do you deal with that? So we kind of try, try to keep them there, even though they do get the 30s and, and the 35s, but later we can build them in terms of building confidence. So it's all about confidence, and of course you need to work through the difficult times. There's no easy way in terms of, of, of dealing with the mathematics, yes. Mm. Excellent. Mm. The, the last the question that I've got was, um, maybe so we can have a different presentation by uh, somebody in this field. 
but I'm also taken in by that that little food garden you had okay. there. Okay. How easy was it to set up, and how easy is it to access assistance um, to be able to do that? Because it will be good if we could have another presentation sometime to actually teach people how to actually do this. Absolutely, I think um, it's, it's, it's for, for me personally, my experience in terms of the memorial garden is about how you ask. Um, yes, there's, there are many organizations around, many of them want to get into schools in terms of assisting. Um, this particular garden started uh, within COVID. So we started within COVID, there was definitely a need for it. Um, in fact, the community um, came to us. We need the space, can we collaborate with you? Can we partner with you? Uh, we do have a feeding scheme running here. Yes. And that is how we got in um, the organization called um, Violence Prevention Urban, uh, Urban Renewal. Um, they're quite a big company, and, and of course, um, we, they gave us access to, to what they have. Um, they gave us the big thing, it's probably the ball, the water, which they definitely did for us. Um, the pumps, everything, they gave us tanks, Jojo, Jojo tanks. Um, so operation was kind of easy, but you need to get the, the buy-in of the community. The school can't do it on, on, on their own. So you need to have at least some of the, the, the uh, parents involved with, of course, with the SGB. Um, other than that, I think the, the departments, I was also involved with the Department of, of Agriculture. I um, had engaged with them too. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not that difficult, but it's a lot of paperwork involved and, uh, in, terms of, in, in terms of getting it from, from them. In fact, we're still within the process, even though we do have the garden, um, nothing uh, denies us in terms of having access to the Department of Agriculture in terms of their funding too. We can even access their funding. It is possible. So, yes. <coughs> Shukran, Brother Adnan. Indeed, we are very proud of your achievements and your commitment for, as you say, activism and education.